Hi Founder fans, Jason here, and we are about to start our Week in Review, where I wrap up the last seven articles published on my website, founderoftheday.com. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, a uh, bunch of new ones, a little bit of out west, and we're going to dive pretty much right on into it today. Not a lot of announcements, just getting right to it. So, first of all, I'm going to press the right button here, and we're going to bring up Barutus. As always, every Friday, including tomorrow and now last Friday, I like to talk about the uh, Essays of Brutus, a group of papers published back and forth with the Federalist Papers in the papers of New York uh, at the uh, during the constitutional ratification debates. So let's get into it. Brutus number 15 discusses pretty much the judicial system under the Constitution of the United States. Specifically, it points out certain parts that are similar to the British style of jurisprudence, but uh, a little bit incorrect. Now, notably, most of American law, especially American common law, comes from British common law. But there are certain parts, and we're about to get into it, that the Constitution took on from Great Britain that just don't seem to make it any sense to Brutus. And Brutus says specifically, uh, he, he talks a lot about why the Constitution is destined to fail because of this. Um, in Great Britain, the justices are independent of the government. The, the legislature, I'm sorry, the, the king cannot just simply remove a justice. They are appointed for life. And the reason for this is when you have a monarchy, well, that monarch can do eh, tyrannical things from time to time and get rid of judges for seemingly no reason. In fact, leading up to the Revolutionary War, one of the things that the colonists complained about in their grievances in the Declaration of Independence was that, hey, the king has taken our judges that we chose and replaced them with his own men. And one of the reasons in England someone served for life is once they were appointed, the king couldn't just come and get rid of them. Now, in America, there was no royalty. So there was no one who can come just remove these people from power. Therefore, maybe in America, judges should not be appointed for life. Maybe they should uh, be able to sit for good behavior, Brutus says, but they should have terms, not necessarily limited terms, but terms. Now, on top of this, Brutus points out that, well, in England, the judges are beholden to the House of Lords. If, if Parliament doesn't like what the decisions justices are making, they could be removed, not removed, but their, their decisions could be overturned by the legislature in Great Britain. And Brutus's argument in this paper is, well, if they're appointed for life, so that the nobility can't take them out, and they are overseen by the legislature, then why is it that we're doing the opposite in America, where judges, there's seemingly, there's no nobility, so why are they appointed for life? And they can make mistakes. So why are they not overseen by the legislature? And as he's been saying for several papers now, Brutus says, well, this is no good. These justices being appointed for life are beholden to no one, and they are going to make decisions that no one can change, and it's going to be terrible. Now, whether or not it was terrible, that's for you to decide. <laughs> but that is certainly what Brutus was predicting at the time. So that's a brief overview of Brutus number 15. And we will be talking about Brutus again next week, but we're almost done with them. We've been through a bunch of them now. Uh, there's only, I believe, 16 in total, including like the parts of each. So look forward to that. Let's bounce on over to our next founder, who is going to be, drumroll please, Isaac Sears. Okay. So, our next founder is Isaac Sears. Isaac Sears was a ship captain who made a lot of money. And eventually, by the age of 33, he was able to, I don't want to say retire, but move to New York City, leave the seas behind him, and start actually uh, a merchant business where he hired other people to steer the ships. So Sears does this. He makes a whole lot of money. Uh, and as the as things start coming in, as these 
a revolution starts a brewing, well, he becomes an important member of the New York Sons of Liberty. And the New York City chapter of the Sons of Liberty is very important. Boston Sons of Liberty gets a lot of credit, uh, rightfully so. And when we hear the phrase Sons of Liberty, most of us kind of default in our brains to Boston. There were Sons of Liberties throughout the colonies, and New York's was, I'd argue, number two in importance. One of the reasons is Isaac Sears was out there just being Isaac Sears about things uh, and being a really important leader. In fact, he was able to uh, assemble a mob very quickly to the point where he earned the nickname King Sears because his ability to just go out and in half an hour get a hundred people riling in the streets. And I should note that when I use the term mob, that was the term they used at the time, and it doesn't have the inclinations that it has necessarily today. Uh, today you think a reckless mob just going out and causing destruction. In a fashion, that is what happened with mobs, uh, and that is how the elite often looked at them at the time. But mobs were considered a, a political tool. At a time where most people didn't have the right to vote, a mob would get together and go and shout in front of someone's house. Also, it is important to note that the elite, as we or they would call them, uh, lived in the same cities and right in the same towns as everyone else. So you could literally get a mob and go to the governor's house. And there wasn't much to stop you. There was, of course, malicious. But uh, they had to get called out, and they didn't always get called out in time. And it was a way for the people who did not have franchisement to be able to go to the government and say, we're angry, change what you're doing. Uh, and Isaac Sears, King Sears' ability to assemble these mobs so quickly was extremely important, not only early on for the Stamp Act Congress uh, and, and against the Stamp Act, but later on, throughout the early buildup to the American Revolution. he was arguably one of the top most important movers and or shakers in pre-revolutionary New York. Now, I do want to talk about the Battle of Golden Hill. Isaac Sears was a leader at the Battle of Golden Hill. He, uh, what was happening is the, the patriots in New York would erect a liberty pole to say, ah, ah, you're doing a bad job, king in parliament. And then the redcoats would take it down. And then they put another one up and take it down. And then the Patriots would put up pamphlets and then the British would take them down. And they'd put up more pamphlets and take them down. Uh, and eventually, uh, a, a soldier actually put out, a, a British soldier put out a pamphlet which attacked Sears and the Sons of Liberty and essentially accused them of terrorism. What we would consider terrorism, not with a, a word they would use back then. But this all boils over on January 19th, 1770, when a group of Redcoats attempt to... Uh, they attempt to post a notice against the Sons of Liberty. They're basically saying, no more meeting as a Son of Liberty. And Sears, King Sears assembles one of his mobs, and the mob gets together, and they go down towards the mayor's office. And there are a bunch of redcoats who sound the alarm, and they come out, and they're ready to put down this mob. Unfortunately for them, they realize there's a whole lot more people in this crowd than there are of us. Uh, and... Interestingly enough, there was some scuffling. Now, no one was killed, but there was some violence here, and people were injured, and then everything settled down. Now, this was six weeks before the Boston Massacre, more famous, but in a similar situation where it was a few soldiers and a big crowd. Now, the Boston Massacre people were killed, and that's why it was so much more outrageous, but six weeks before that, in January of 1770, the Battle of Golden Hill was a battle where a few people were a little hurt, but it was the first violence, in my pers from my perspective, of the American Revolution. There are other mobs in Massachusetts, yada, 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 but this is the first one that we call a battle, even though it kind of wasn't. It was more of a hostage situation, but still. Uh, it is the first violence in New York, and it really is arguably the first violence of the American Revolution. Uh, though, of course, the war itself doesn't start for five more years. And I, I do like to bring this up because it does reiterate how important not just Boston, but New York and other cities were in the lead up to the Revolutionary War. Now, as for Sears himself, uh, he plays a role in New York's early rev revolutionary government, and he's actually recommended by John Adams for uh, a naval command, though he does not receive one in the Continental Navy. Uh, when the British take over New York City, he flees. The, he obviously flees New York City, doesn't want to be hanging around with the British. He goes back to his old job of captaining a ship where he acts as a privateer throughout most of the war. Makes a lot of money, makes a fortune. Uh, and then very interestingly enough, after the war is over, he attempts to be one of those first people to open a trade between North America and China. 
and he sails to China, uh, but sadly, almost as soon as he arrives there, he falls ill and passes away, and he was buried in Canton Harbor. He is the first American and possibly one of the only founders to be actually buried in China. So that's a, a really interesting wrap-up. And for Isaac Sears, just an extraordinarily important, almost, I want to call him a, a, a Sam Adams of New York, arguably, because of the way he could get the rabble to rouse. So uh, that is an overview of the life of Isaac Sears. Uh, Ashley with a question. Is the reason justices can be impeached because of Brutus? Um, no, the, the constitution, so again, Brutus is, at the same time the Federalists are promoting the constitution, Brutus is arguing against it, and then the our constitution had already been written and made public at this point. So, uh, and, and impeachment was in the original constitution. Uh, Brutus does mention that several times throughout his argument. He did mention it in the last paper. I didn't get into it, so thank you for bringing it up. Uh, but... Basically, he his problem is they can only be impeached for crimes and misdemeanors, which, from his perspective, is too hard. They're like, what can what counts as a crime and misdemeanor? You know, like and and what he says would come up. We talked about John Picking uh, 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 about picking. Is it to me, John Pickering a few weeks ago, who was the first judge to be impeached, and it was during the Jefferson administration. John Pickering had been losing his mental facilities. And he could no longer, unfortunately, he was he couldn't really live his life properly, let alone be a judge. But had he committed a crime or a misdemeanor? Well, Thomas Jefferson did successfully get the Senate and House to impeach him. But it was very questionable to a lot of people. No, constitutionally, he hasn't actually committed a crime. And that was Brutus's perspective. But it, funnily, funnily uh, it's funny to me that... Other anti-federalists were arguing it was too easy to impeach a judge because you could call anything a crime or misdemeanor. So, um, no, Brutus is not uh, does not get credit for that. Although, like we said last week, the Sixth Amendment in almost its entirety and a good portion of the Fifth Amendment, the Double Jeopardy Clause, I like to give Brutus a big thumbs up for uh, helping us get those passed. Thank you, Ashley. Great question. Uh, let's move on to... The next founder, founder number three, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. All right. We are looking at, uh, yeah, no problem, Ashley. Thank you for asking. And thanks for coming. And everyone who's here, thank you for hitting like. I see most of you have. Thank you so much. Um, let's move right along here. We are on William Bradford Jr. So I do want to note that William Bradford Jr.'s father was an important American founder in his own right, uh, William Bradford Sr., but today we're going to focus on William Bradford Jr. because he actually makes it to one of the highest levels in a presidential cabinet you're going to want to see. Uh, but I want to start off, actually I have a quote here in my article from uh, right after he left college. You see, he went to college at Princeton and William Bradford Jr. graduated from Princeton just before the American Revolution broke out. And he graduated with some interesting friends. One is Philip Furneaux, who is one of the first uh, poets and playwrights of the early United States, and uh, another guy you might know named James Madison. Now, uh, he actually writes, and, and this is, again, right after they graduate, he's writing to his friend James Madison. The whole world's their oyster. They don't know what they're going to do. And, and he, he writes, quote, What business I shall follow for life I have not yet determined. It is a matter which requires deliberation, and as I am pressed by age, I intend not to be in a hurry about it. This is William Bradford Jr. talking to his friend, uh, hey, Z Patriot, new name, like it. Uh, so, uh, anyway, <laughs> William Bradford Jr., uh, he graduates with these friends. One of them is James Madison, and they're casually talking about, we don't know what we're going to do when we grow up, even though they just graduated college. One of them, James Madison, would do some things you know about. Philip Furneaux, as I said, uh, just wrote a new play. They were mourning the passing of a friend. But William Bradford Jr. would do great things. In fact, when the revolution breaks out, Bradford joins the Pennsylvania militia and becomes a lieutenant colonel, which is a pretty high rank for still a very young man in his early 20s. Uh, he ends up being appointed by George Washington as Deputy Mustermaster General. 
Muster Master General is one of the most fun things to say. And the Muster Master General, for those of you who don't know, uh, when you muster, you get things together. It's like you muster the courage. Uh, and he was really in charge, or well, deputy in charge, of making sure that all of these thousands of soldiers now in the Continental Army are present and accounted for. You know what I mean? So uh, it's it's a really tall order because thousands of people you're trying to make sure are there. Unfortunately, after two years, he starts suffering from ill health and he resigns his post to start studying law. Looks like he found out what he was going to do. He's still just 24 years of age at this point and, and just barely passes the bar when he's named Attorney General of Pennsylvania. Again, this is right in the heart of the Revolutionary War. He's named Attorney General of Pennsylvania, and he would hold that position for the next 11 years, over a decade, as the leading prosecutor in one of the most important young states. Uh, um, he spends, like I said, 11 years there. It was basically the years between ratification of the Declaration... Um, uh, uh, de the signing of the Declaration of Independence and ratification of the Constitution. Um... Eventually, because of his amazing job, he's elected as a member of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, where he oversees several really important uh, uh, early cases in that state. And he does such an impressive job on the Supreme Court that he is chosen by um, President George Washington to step in as Attorney General of the United States. He replaces Edmund Randolph and becomes the second. Attorney General of the United States. Sadly, I don't have a lot to tell you about what he did there because just two years after that, he has a brief illness and passes away at just 40 years old. Uh, it's a shame. And, and it's really interesting because he said in that quote I had how he didn't feel like he was pressed for time and could take his time doing things. Granted, he did that and by 24 was Attorney General of Pennsylvania. But after that, you know, he dies at just 40 years old, so maybe he was a little more pressed for time than he thought. Uh, that is a brief overview of the life of William Bradford Jr. I see some things over here. Uh, again, hi, AZ. Hi, TJ. Hi, everyone else. Thank you for coming. Hope we're having a good time. That was founder number uh, three, which is English for toi, and I think, right? Toi, is that the French way to say it? I did not do good in languages in school. Okay, we're going to bounce on to the Wizard Owl of Hopewell, Andrew Pickens. Okay. Our next founder is Andrew Pickens. Andrew Pickens was born in Pennsylvania, but his family traveled kind of a lot trying to find their place in the world. Uh, eventually end up close to the South Carolina frontier where he grows up and he serves with the, um, uh, he, he becomes friendly with the Native Americans there. Then he serves in the Anglo-Cherokee war which gives him experience as a soldier this is even before the uh french and indian war uh and eventually when the revolutionary war breaks out he sides with the patriots luckily and he joins the south carolina militia as a captain now throughout the war he would eventually obtain the rank of brigadier general but uh for, he starts off as a i don't want to say lowly captain it's an important position but he starts off as a captain uh he participates in almost all of the major battles of the South. It's not even worth naming all of them because he is in just really, I, I'm surprised it's taking me this long to write about Pickens because he is, I don't want to say he's the most important, but he's up there with the Daniel Morgans uh, and, and, and um, I, I, names that are escaping me of the world. Uh, I wouldn't put him at the Nathaniel Green level necessarily, but he's really important, and his name isn't quite as celebrated, though he does have several counties and towns throughout the South named after him, so he does have that. So, unfortunately, in 1780, he's actually captured when he's trying to hold a fort at uh, 94's... Uh, uh, there was a, I forget the name of the town. It's weird. It's like a number. 94 or something like that. Anyway, he's taken prisoner. He is... Uh, luckily paroled pretty quickly, but he's given the condition that he he can be paroled, but he is not to fight against the British again. He goes home, and this has happened to a few patriots who fought in the South, where he goes home, says, okay, I won't fight. Then the British come, they burn down some of his property, they take his stuff, they scare his family, and he considers that a violation of the parole agreement. You said, I would not be, I could go about my life unmolested if I didn't fight against you. Here you are destroying my life. I'm going to go fight against you. So he breaks his parole and returns to the militia. That's when he plays an integral role uh, supporting Daniel Morgan and Nathaniel Green during the final year of the primary fighting. He's, a, like I said, 
all the major battles, uh, leading and and having moved up the ranks, leading hundreds, even thousands of men to victory in the Revolutionary War. Now, when the war concludes, he he becomes active in state politics. He serves in the uh, government of South Carolina on a few occasions, but he also builds a property called Hopewell. And Hopewell is very interesting because it's used to create uh, treaties with the Native Americans. Uh, he has friends, Benjamin Hawkins, who was the Continental Congress's representative to the Native Americans, superintendent of Indian Affairs, as it was called at the time, and actually I think still is called, uh, and Joseph Martin who he himself had a lot to do with people moving out west and, and populating the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and, and at his house, Pickens helps create three different treaties. Now, it's strange because each of these treaties is called the Treaty of Hopewell. It's not even like the first Treaty of Hopewell and the second Treaty of Hopewell. No, they are all just called the Treaty of Hopewell. Um, now, uh, the, the three treaties, one is with the Cherokee Nation, one is with the Chickasaw Nation, and one is with the Choctaw Nation. Uh, and, and because his ability to negotiate, they give him the nickname that I will mispronounce, uh, Skyagunsta, which apparently translates to the Wizard Owl. And it's because he was seen as such, um, a, 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 like owls are seen. He was seen to be wise and collected and, and a very good negotiator, looking for the best for everyone involved. Uh, and it speaks very highly of him that he was given this nickname uh, and that he was working with Hawkins and Martin. So that is, again, an extraordinarily brief overview of Andrew Pickens. I apologize to anyone watching who wants to get into the weeds of the battles. <laughs> These are very brief overviews. Uh, and, and I like to go over the battles from time to time separately. Like we talked about the Battle of Golden Hill. Usually I will focus on a founder on one battle, but Pickens had so many battles. How am I supposed to choose? Uh, again, an extraordinarily important American founder. Okay. He is a very scary looking dude. I could not find a better... I need to take a sip of water. I could not find a better picture of him. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, TJ. Pretty funny. <laughs> Yeah, he's real interesting. Like I said, all these battles, I thought for the article, with the articles, they're they're brief, and I try and just focus on one story that makes them a little different. And and while Pickens was amazingly important to dozens of battles, uh, his he, he acting as host at the Treaty of Hopewell, I thought was really what makes him stand out. All right, next founder, pop it up. It is one of the Biddles. Okay. Our next founder is Charles Biddle. Now, I need to give a big shout out to Janet, one of my longtime readers who has been telling me to write about the Biddles uh, for like about two years now. She's also sent me a few things, helped me with my family history. So extra big thank you to Janet for that. Uh, and every once in a while, she'll remind me to write about a Biddle. So I'm writing about a Biddle. Now, the Biddle family, as fun as it is to say, Biddle, uh, there were a lot of them in the American Revolution. And, and it's surprising that the name isn't more famous in American history because they were Philadelphia, mostly merchants, but the Biddle family is a hugely important family in Philadelphia. Uh, Charles would have a, a brother who, uh, uh, Nicholas, who was uh, uh, with the Battle of Barbados and had a ship burned. Uh, a, a few of them served throughout uh, on the high seas. So they were a merchant family, but they were also a captain family. Biddle was no different. This Biddle, Charles Biddle, was no different. And Charles Biddle actually, in early 17, uh, late 1775, goes to France and returns in early 1776, after the war is broken out, on one of the earliest missions to France to try and secure gunpowder and other stores of that nature for fighting the British, which he does successfully. He returns in early 1776, just about the time that people are reading Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Charles Biddle brings one of his ships back full of gunpowder. Now, unfortunately, he seems to have fallen on the ride somehow, and he gets real hurt. Uh, he, he actually tries to secure a position on the Navy board, which oversaw things in the Navy, and a lot of people thought he was a good uh, uh, person for that because he had so much experience on the seas, and they were in Philadelphia, where his family was from, and the Biddle family was one of the most important families in Philadelphia at the time. So it made a lot of sense, but unfortunately, he doesn't get that position. Luckily, he seems to heal up, and he's actually uh, goes to join George Washington during the New York, New Jersey campaign when they're fighting uh, from New York through New Jersey. <laughs> so he's actually captured later that year in October of 1776, and he's kept as a prisoner for about a year. After this, 
he, you know, he's eventually exchanged because he is, you know, wealthy and famous. Uh, maybe not famous, but from a very wealthy family. So he is uh, uh, paroled and exchanged, I should say, because he's allowed to fight in the war. And he serves as a privateer for a while. And then he goes to North Carolina to see one of his brothers and also gets married to a Hannah Shepherd, who's from a fairly notable family in North Carolina. But he just couldn't stay away from the service, so he gets another ship, and then he starts privateering again. And of course, privateering is when you capture a ship, you get to keep the prize, and you're allowed to do it. You're not a pirate, because you're fighting for a country that said you could. That's the only difference. Uh, this is the second time he is privateering, and the second time he is also captured. This time he's kept in New York, but he gets exchanged again. He returns to Pennsylvania, and in 1785, just after the war is finally officially done, Charles Biddle is chosen as vice president of Pennsylvania's Supreme Executive Council. Now, Pennsylvania, they tried a really silly government for the first few years there. I don't want to say it was silly. They tried their best to come up with an interesting government. It was a unicameral system. Uh, there was basically a legislature and then this governing board instead of a president, a governor or a president. So the, the executive council was this board that did the executive stuff, and they had a legislature which did the legislating stuff. And, of course, a Supreme Court that did the judicial stuff. Now, the Supreme Executive Council had several members and a president who usually is referred to nowadays as the governor, but they were called president. They were just president of the board. Charles became vice president of Pennsylvania, one of the most important positions in one of the most important states with arguably the most important city at the time. During this time, Philadelphia hosts the Constitutional Convention uh, and Biddle hosts many famous guests, including George Washington comes to his house while they're writing the Constitution. Um, once the new government takes over, however, Charles becomes loosely affiliated with the Democratic Society. And Democratic Societies were started by Peter Muhlenberg, but would pop up all over the, the states at the time uh, in the early George Washington administration. And they were, during the transition from Anti-Federalist to Jeffersonian Democrat and the Democratic Republicans, there was a brief time where they were democratic societies and they were separate independent institutions that basically supported the anti-administration talking points what's interesting is uh just a few years later biddle would be considered for a position in the washington administration but alexander hamilton argues against him because he was affiliated with these democratic societies aka he's on jefferson's side and hamilton doesn't want anything to do with that hamilton actually kind of questions his character which i found very interesting because other than that he seems to have had been very respected among people and in fact i will note hamilton says that even hamilton doesn't like his character he could win people from the other side to george washington's cause in any particular situation so he goes back to private life for about 20 years, just, you know, being a merchant. And then eventually he's actually chosen in 1812, just before the War of 1812 breaks out. He's chosen by President James Madison to sign treasury notes. So they were printing treasury notes and they needed authorized people to sign them. And two people were chosen to sign these. And he signs I, I, at one point. He's quoted to have signed at least 1800 in a single day. That's a lot of autographs. <laughs> Fascinatingly, he is actually let go by President Madison after about two years of this because he is criticized for siding too much with the Federalist Party. So he didn't get a position in the Washington administration because Hamilton thought Biddle was too associated with the Democratic Republicans. And then he's let go of a position in the Madison administration because he's too close with the Federalists. It's very interesting. Now, he retires after this. He's grown old over the decades we've just discussed. But he does witness two of his sons becoming extremely important in the War of 1812. Uh, uh, war heroes. Now, uh, mostly in the naval battles of the War of 1812. But he is, again, the Biddle family is extremely important. Thank you, Janet, for pointing it out that I should be covering them more. Because they're extremely important uh, in the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. And even one of... Charles, I think, believe it's Charles Biddle's sons. Might be his nephew. I might be mistaken, but I believe it's one of his sons. Nicholas Biddle in the 1830s is the head of the Second Bank 
of the United States when Andrew Jackson comes along and Andrew Jackson, you know, it says on his gravestone, I killed the banks. Well, the guy who he, he didn't actually kill, but the guy who was running those banks was Nicholas Biddle. And Nicholas Biddle and and President Andrew Jackson would have a famous uh, battle there. It's not as famous as it probably should be, but a famous battle. Uh, and he was the other guy on the other side of that discussion. So those of you who like Jackson, there is one Biddle you might not love. Uh, and for those of you who don't like Jackson, well, you might like uh, Nicholas Biddle. I suggest you look into that story at a later date. Just re reiterating how important the Biddle family was to early American history. So... Thank you for watching. <laughs> let's, uh, let's bounce over here. I'm going to take another sip. It's gotten hot out here. Not hot enough to turn on the little AC I have over there, but hot enough to make my face red in the camera. <laughs> Sorry about that. I tried to change the light setting today so I wasn't, like, too red. Because there is a video coming up. I did a great interview with Jane Hampton Cook where I look like an apple. <laughs> I'll look forward to that next week. We're going to talk about Simon Kenton. Okay. Our next founder is Simon Kenton. Simon Kenton was from Virginia, and at just 16 years old, he was in love, and he loved this woman, and she also had another suitor who he did not like, who he attacked, and he thought he killed this person. So at just 16 years old, Simon Kenton runs to the wilderness. He changed his name and starts living under the name Simon Butler, and he would live under this name for more than a decade. Uh, Simon Butler. Uh, and I do see uh, Kentucky History Channel there. I was recommended to talk about Simon Butler from uh, uh, um, Colonel Russ Carson Jr., who was just on this week, who was also on Thursdays just after this. If you like watching live history, you want to learn about Kentucky, Kentucky History Channel is down there. Uh, and it was Russ. Uh, they are going live talking about, I'm sure, something fun tonight at about nine o'clock. So right after we're done here, thank you, Jameson, for popping in. <laughs> and Russ is the one who recommended Kenton. So let's get back to it. <laughs> Today's founder is Simon Kenton. Again, at 16 years old, he attacked a guy because his love interest was also interested in that guy. So he runs away. <laughs> and uh, uh, he runs to the woods and under a fake name, Simon Butler, thinking he would be charged with murder, Simon Butler ends up becoming an extraordinarily important part of the founding of Kentucky and all of the Old Northwest and everything on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. He becomes friends with Daniel Boone, uh, allegedly one time saved Daniel Boone's life. And I didn't put this in the article because I couldn't confirm it, but Russ had mentioned to me that one day he's walking, Simon Kenton is walking through the woods and he hears whistling and uh, he runs over to see who it is. And it's just Daniel Boone, just naked, walking through the woods naked because it was the wilderness and there was very little around very brave souls just walking out into the wilderness and kenton is one of these people now when the revolutionary war breaks out kenton who's still a young man just barely into his 20s joins the patriot cause uh he, as i said he, he saves daniel boone's life he joins george rogers clark uh illinois campaign in the old northwest where they go up through the ohio valley region it is one of the most important parts of the revolutionary war and least discussed i like to say here the western theater is extraordinarily underrated. I suggest you look into it when you have the time or listen to the rest of this. So in 1778, Kenton is actually captured by the Shawnee people and he is tortured. He's made to run the gauntlet, which is when you run and they just hit you with rocks and whips and sticks and whatever they got. Uh, and he was brought to the edge of life, but he was so tough and and so strong and, and, and impressed the Shawnee to such a degree that they changed their position on him and actually they adopted him into the community, uh, which was very important for several reasons. First of all, because now he was friendly with the Shawnee and he could help negotiate later in life. But he's eventually released in a prisoner exchange and he goes back to serve under George Rogers Clark to the end of the war. Now, in 1782, a full 11 years after he attacked that guy as a 16 year old, he finds out, wait a minute, he's still alive. And I guess in back at that, at that point, no harm, no foul. If you weren't dead, <laughs> then they weren't going to charge you with any crimes. And finally, uh, at 27 years old, Simon Kenton can live his life as Simon Kenton again and drop that fake butler name for good. Uh, in 1785, he's 30 years old. The war is over and he gets married and he goes to live a quiet life. And he finally learns how to read at 30 years old. So there's that. <laughs> Amazing. So... He's in private life and a decade goes by living out 
in the uh, he uh, I settled in Ohio for the most part. And he's out there, and then another war breaks out. The uh, Northwest Indian War, which had kind of always been going on before the revolution and really heated up in the years after. And he joins the Ohio militia and goes back to serve. And he serves at the Battle of Fallen T Timbers when Mad Anthony Wayne uh, basically wins the Northwest Indian War and secures most of the Ohio greater Ohio region, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, parts of, I believe, Minnesota, that is all finally officially under the United States banner. Um, the Native Americans essentially seize their right, uh, uh, not seize, um, cede their rights to that place at that time. Now, another 20 years go by and the War of 1812 breaks out. And once again, now an older man and a brigadier general in the Ohio militia, Simon Kenton goes back out to fight. He fights uh, alongside William Henry Harrison and others. And he's there at the Battle of Thames when uh, Tecumseh, Native American leader Tecumseh, is uh, beaten and killed by the Americans. And he knew Tecumseh. So Simon Kenton is actually asked to identify the body of Tecumseh. And he looks around and he sees that the other people there are going to, they want pieces of him. It sounds, it's really gross, but they want to take like his bones or a scalp and they want to deface his body so they could say like, this is the Tecumseh's leg, you know? Um, again, really gross, but they wanted that war victory trophy. And because of this and the respect he had for Tecumseh, Simon Kenton actually identifies the wrong body. And I forgot to put in my article and I, the name escapes me. And I'm really embarrassed about the body because it was another chief that he said was Tecumseh, and they defaced his body. Um, but he does save the cadaver of Tecumseh from being defaced. And I understand he was later taken back and buried. So again, and then he get, uh, retires again. <laughs> no more wars for him. That's three real serious wars. Um, an amazing person, Simon Kenton, Kenton. Probably not the best guy in the world. He did almost kill someone when he was 16, but still an American founder. And I hope you learned a little bit about him today. Again, real hot, taking a sip. We're gonna go to our last founder for the day. As we rock through, oh, we're going pretty quick today, whoopsie. Oh, well, not wasting your time, getting right to the good stuff. We're gonna talk about Jeremiah F. Everts. Jeremiah F. Everts is today's founder, was published today. Um, let's talk about him. So our next founder is Jeremiah F. Everts. Jeremiah Everts was born and grew up in Vermont uh, just as the Revolutionary War was going on. So he's too young to serve, but he does go and uh, gets an education at Yale and becomes a lawyer just uh, as Thomas Jefferson's becoming president, to put some context on it. So he ends up, first of all, marrying, I can never say this name, Metibel, M-E-H-I-T-A-B-E-L, Metibel Sherman Barnes. She was a widow and her father was Roger Sherman, which if you've been to this channel before, you probably know about Roger Sherman, who signed everything. I called him an ultra founder, in this, uh, an ultra signer in this article, because he signed all the documents. Extremely important person. Uh, he had passed away by the time his daughter married Jeremiah F. Everts, but uh, that makes him part of the extended Roger uh, 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 Sherman family. And there's a bigger name to it. It's like the Sherman Frisbee Whore family, which are three last names. Maybe I'll do a tree about them because they were really important to American history. Um, anyway, Jeremiah F. Everts becomes extremely spiritual. He uh, joins the American Board of the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions. Now, I am going to write an article about that next week, so I'm not going to get too much into it. But essentially, the Second Great Awakening comes out just as George Washington is becoming president. And there's in the first and second, third presidential administrations, there's a lot of religious fervor going on. People are really getting back into religion. And uh, Everts is one of these people. And he joins the American Board, which the American Board was in charge of sending missionaries. Is the first American uh organization to send missionaries around the world to try and convert people to Christianity. It's interesting, again, I'm going to talk about this next week, but they convert, uh, they include a bunch of different denominations of Christianity are allowed to be part of the board and go convert people. Uh, now, at, for Everard's part, 
first of all, he starts print. He's the editor of a paper called the Panoplist, which it runs for 15 years. And it's a, a religious organization. He writes hundreds of articles about, you know, trying to inspire people to become more religious during the second great awakening. Uh, additionally, by 1812, about when the War of 1812 is starting, he becomes treasurer of the Bo American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions. And on this board, as the treasurer, he oversees the fin finances of this now worldwide organization being run out of the young United States. By 1821, he becomes secretary of the organization. And it's interesting, as secretary, uh, he is corresponding around the world with people trying to spread Christianity, American Christianity, whatever that means, uh, around the world. Uh, he continues, he's most famous for his being against, as it says here, the Indian removal. Now we're getting a little past the American founding here in 1830, uh, when Andrew Jackson becomes president, which again, I don't really consider part of the American founding, but it bleeds together. See, over the decades, while they were sending missionaries around the world to convert people to Christianity, they were also sending them to Native Americans in North America. And one of these was the Cherokee Nation, who we had mentioned before Andrew Pickens and others had uh, established a peace with. Now, Jeremiah very much focused on them because they were right next to the United States at the time. And they wanted them, Jeremiah Everts wanted them to assimilate, assimilate into American culture. Now, again, I know nowadays uh, we have discussion about whether or not assimilation would have been the right way to go. I shouldn't even say nowadays. Back then, there was arguments about assimilation. Uh, we just mentioned Tecumseh recently, and Tecumseh, uh, his younger brother, uh, w was considered a prophet. Uh, not a Cherokee prophet, but a prophet all the same. Uh, and they were saying we should not assimilate, we should be our own people. But there were Native Americans who went out there and said, listen, we should assimilate into American culture. They're expanding anyway. There's not much we can do. So this debate that even we have today, they were having at the time. Now, Jeremiah thought they should assimilate. What he thought they shouldn't do is be removed. And Andrew Jackson, obviously, wanted to remove them. That's why he pushed for the Indian Removal Act, which sadly led to the Trail of Tears, which in hindsight was an atrocity, for lack of a better word. Uh, sorry, Jackson fans. It did not go well. <laughs> um, so, uh... Andrew, uh, Andrew Jackson. So Jeremiah Everts, he is, he lobbies against this. He goes to Congress. He goes to Washington and he knows that there are congressmen who don't agree with the Removal Act. And he tries to get them to talk to other congressmen who are on the fence about what should we do here? How do we resolve this issue? And try and use the moral high ground to get that, uh, to, to stop Indian removal. Now, sadly, he dies that same year. And unfortunately, uh, I read a quote that makes a lot of sense that uh, with the death of Jeremiah Everts, so too did the fight to prevent removal die with it. Now, I do want to say that he had very, and he died young of tuberculosis. He was in his early 40s, I believe. Um, uh, not even, yeah, uh, 20, 40, uh, mid 40s. Anyway, that's <laughs> uh, not my strong suit. So, he used a moral and religious argument against removal. He thought it was, he would, he would say, as a Christian, I find this immoral. And that, that removing people from their homes is not the Christian thing to do. And while this argument didn't work at the time for the Native Americans, it was picked up by early abolitionists. So there had been movements to end slavery since before the Revolutionary War, but it's really in the in the 1820s, then into the 1830s and 40s that the abolitionist movement really picks up. That you start seeing Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and um, the Underground Railroad. And again, I'm getting a little past the founding here, but these people picked up on Everett's moral Christian arguments against Indian removal and transferred it over to the uh, uh, abolitionist movement and against slavery. And a lot of the things he said in the, the 18 teens and 1820s when he was writing for the Panopolis, those same arguments were taken and recycled and reused for this new, uh, I don't want to say more important cause, but very important also cause. Uh, and and that is really his lasting legacy. Though I should note, he did he did have some children, one of whom was William M. Everts, and this is way after the American founding, uh, but he ends up becoming 
uh, Senator for New York, uh, U.S. Attorney General, and Secretary of State during the Hayes administration. That's the 1870s. It's 40-something years after his dad dies. But still, he does raise this child with this particular background who ends up becoming uh, one of the most important people in the cabinet of one of the most overlooked periods of American history. So, thank you uh, so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned a little bit about a guy who probably shouldn't be so obscure, James F. Everts. So, I'll pop me back up. I'm not, am I? Nope. I am. Okay, sorry. <gasps> right. Woo, it's getting hot in here. Uh, there are a few questions here. I'm going to check out here. Uh, when we're done, it we're, uh, looks like we're ending a little bit early today. I ran through it real fast. Uh, definitely pop over to the Kentucky History Channel and check out what they're doing over there. Uh, they go live from Facebook every Thursday. Well, several days a week now. I can't speak for them, but there are some questions here. Thank you, Patriot. You are a number one in my book. Ashley, not to diss Simon Kenton, but he definitely looks like he would almost kill someone. <laughs> well... When you're talking about how awful someone's face is, Ashley, I don't know if they're going to take it like that. <laughs> no offense, but you're awful to look at. <laughs> uh, I was wondering how you pronounce it. Oh, TJ, you were wondering how you pronounce it. I think it's medible. I think it's medible. If you're just saying in conversation, it's medible, but it might be metable. Metable. Um, I don't know. And if there's a medible watching, I do <laughs> apologize for mispronouncing your name. Uh, there are certain names that you don't hear a lot anymore. That is a name you never, ever, ever hear. Ever. <laughs> like, I mean, if anyone watching has ever met a medible, please let me know because I love old timey names like that that don't get a lot of play anymore. And I would like to learn that. So I will say a big thank you to you guys for watching. Uh, trivia tomorrow. So if you're new here, hit subscribe down there because we play trivia on Fridays. Uh, I am, like I've mentioned, I went back to pre-recording the videos earlier in the week and that was a good idea because now I have uh, two interviews already set up to go on next week. Uh, I think, I'm thinking Monday, Tuesday, we got Michael Troy coming back, uh, Jane, uh, um, Jane Hampton Cook coming back, Jane Calvert's also coming soon, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, thank you, TJ. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Nick, you got a question. Do the British try to go after Pickens for dishonoring the parole, or do the British just forget about his parole? No, so they knew about it. I, I, like, it's not like they were hunting him in particular, but if they did find him, he would have been treated extra poorly. There is someone else, and the name is eluding me right now. I apologize, but there is someone else that, um, man, it's really bothering me, that was in this position, that they did... The second time they caught him against his parole, he was uh, imprisoned for a long time. You know what? I will look it up. I'll see if breaking parole. I know I've done an article on it. Um, maybe it'll pop up right now and we can see it. I I think breaking parole would be uh, Isaac Hayne. Isaac Hayne. I found it. Look, I can Google my own website. Imagine that. <laughs> um, so, oh, okay. Yeah, they treated him real bad. So, Isaac Hayne, also in the South Carolina militia. Uh, captured by, uh, I, I don't know if he was an officer or not. I think he was an officer because he was paroled. He's captured uh, during the war. He was one of the large group of prisoners who were paroled with the understanding that they would not fight anymore. He went home. His kids had been sick with smallpox. One of his kids had already died while he was in prison. Um, he goes home. The British come around and they say, okay, we paroled you. We need you to take an oath of loyalty to the crown or you'll be sent to prison. Now, you don't want to go to a British prison obviously. So he signs the, he signs the oath of loyalty and, and he does this out of necessity. And we talked about this also with, uh, um, uh, Middleton, Henry Middleton recently where, you know, he was in a weird situation where he couldn't, uh, he had to take care of his family. What else was he going to do? So he signs the oath saying, okay, he has a handshake promise. I won't serve in the army. You guys leave my family alone. Unfortunately, the British came back and said, Hey, we want you to come serve in the field. And he said, no. <laughs> they said, I signed your loyalty oath, but I am not going to serve against the Patriots. So they were going to put him in prison, but Hain felt his parole had been broken. So he goes back and joins the Continental Army. Uh, he does a bunch of stuff, and sadly he is once again captured. And then... He is hung. 
Isaac Hayes was hanged. Actually, I think is the right term. Hanged. There was no trial. There was no appeal. He was just hanged for breaking his parole. Though, like he thought, and most other people thought, the British were the ones who broke the parole. Um, unfortunately, it was less than three months before the war actually ended. Um, and this is so it's just before Yorktown, August of 1781, just before Yorktown, and the Americans started publishing articles about Haynes' brutal murder, and he becomes arguably the last martyr to the American cause because his name becomes a rallying cry to the patriots. Uh, Marquis de Lafayette mentioned his name before uh, they went, they they attacked, and and, and uh, I'm sorry, Alexander Hamilton before they went into uh, to attack the redoubts in where the most fighting was during the uh, siege of Yorktown, the, the name Hain is being cried out because just these guys, you know, these, these British guys, these Brits are, they're terrible. <laughs> was their opinion. Nowadays, British are, you know, they're fine. You guys are fine. <laughs> I have no, I don't harbor any poor feelings. Uh, so that's our bonus founder, apparently, this week. Um, thank you for bringing that up, Nick. Uh, Tecumseh means shooting star. Oh, that's super cool. That's super cool. Yeah, his brother escapes me, but his brother was considered the prophet. He had a cool name like that, too. But anyway, uh, I guess we'll call it there. I want to say a big thank you to you. Again, thank you to you guys for watching. Uh, I want to give an extra big thank you, thank you to my Patriots on Patreon who helped me offset some of these costs. Uh, it's not free what I'm doing here. I'm not making any money <laughs> not yet hoping to get monetized one day thank you for watching that'll help but uh at this point if you wanted to help me offset some of the payments uh, i'm considering investing in a different streaming service to make higher quality content for you guys and have better interviews so uh if you want to help me do that check out my patreon page i want to say big thanks to matt troy the teresas uh several other people whose names are eluding me right now but uh, you know the handful of you who are supporting me there thank you so much for making this possible everyone else watching's good too because as i said the more you watch the sooner i can monetize and get some advertisements you don't want to watch them but you know give me five seconds and then we'll make some profit thank you guys for watching i will be back with another and tj and tj's a patriot too thank you tj i did not mean to leave you out thank you uh i will be back with you guys tomorrow is trivia and i had an idea that we're going to test run i'm not going to spoil it now but i had an idea that i'm going to test run i think you guys will enjoy it so 8 15 tomorrow come hang out and i'll be back oh when it is we end with a property george washington once owned called round bottom